Dawn has created some of, the, uh, some of the most important television programs, television entertainment programs of the past decade and a half. So you, we have on our stage, I actually think uh, almost for the first time, although we had Tim Kring a couple years ago. Oh, that's uh, impressive. Yeah. So, uh, but you're really one of the few people we've had on the stage who has this, your depth of experience in television, and now you're creating a new medium. Mm -hmm. right? That's what this is. Yeah. So I want to kind of ask you or just a couple questions about what it's like to invent uh, a new medium. I mean, one of the first things that I was wondering about, when you're talking about a hundred television series, that's about... Digital series. Digital series. Digital, digital, series. digital yes, video yes. series. Digital video series. But that's about, uh, you know, 10 or 15 times more than you would create in any given television season. Right. How do you... How do you get both quality and the necessary efficiency at the same time? I'm just thinking of the management job of overseeing a, a hundred series at a time. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's, it's a daunting task, right? And you look at all the brands that we have in the Condé Nast portfolio, and you realize that there are, it's almost like, you know, I, I always make the analogy to the early days of cable, for any of you that may be old enough to remember that, which is like ancient now. But it was, you know, a, a lot of companies kind of carved out a niche and did programming in specific areas. Look at a Viacom. You know, they did Nickelodeon Kids, MTV Music, Comedy Central, which back then was Ha. Um, and, you know, they had all of these niches. So we have that ability with all the brands that we have. And, um, you know, between the editors who have, you know, great ideas and our programming team and the producers that we work with, there is a flood of interesting stories, and being able to tell stories in a wide breadth of, of, of uh, you know, uh, formats, be it either comedy or how-to or reality or, you know, documentary, it's given us the maximum flex flexibility to be able to be as innovative and inventive as we can be. And, you know, I, I, I'm glad to say we haven't even, like, scratched the surface. We really haven't. Now, so how does it work, uh, practically? Um, our uh, you developing the ideas, you have a team internally, or are you being pitched by producers the way you would if you were a network, a uh, television network? Um, are the magazine editors and their staffs kind of coming to you and saying, hey, this, this was a great column in Vogue, but we think this column translates into a, into a video series. How does it happen? So that, the answer would be D, all of the above. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I think that What's been incredible is that, you know, some of the, there, there are different ways in which we're able to get ideas, you know. Some of it is a lot of the television and film producers and directors are excited about this new space, so we are really inundated with pitches and ideas that people bring to us. The editors and their staffs are very, very um, excited about being able to do this kind of quality video. And so, and sometimes we happen across, you know, an idea that was already in the magazine, but it's just fortuitous. An example of that is, you know, we did a, a series called Casualties of the Gridiron, right, which was a different football documentary, which focused on the mental and physical issues that the ex-NFL players now deal with, that their careers are over. This came up uh, through GQ, was this Well, or? this is the irony. So we found the documentary and we found the filmmaker who's so uh, talented. In fact, we were nominated for an Emmy Award up against 30 for 30 and 24 seven. So we were nominated in the TV categories for the Emmys. But it actually was an article that had been in GQ, you know, back in 2009, mm. and we didn't even realize that that was a story in GQ. So a lot of times, just everything sort of crosses over and overlaps. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that uh, uh, has been, I don't know, I don't think it's a controversy in the advertising community, but it's been an issue that's been raised. Uh, uh, Digitas team raised it a year ago. Is the question of finding for consumers' ability to find these series, these digital video programs. We don't have the moral or functional equivalent in our industry of a TV guide that people can turn to and say, here's what's on. Well, by but, the way, they're not turning to TV guide probably that much anymore right, either, right? Right, right, so, right. Yeah. right. So how, but we don't, we don't have an EPG. We don't have an electronic program guide that lists everything. Right. So how do you overcome uh, in, in uh, Condé Nast Entertainment, how do you overcome, or Condé Nast generally, mm -hmm. overcome the challenge of program discovery? So, I mean, this is where I think my television background <clears throat> really is, is a little bit, has a different point of view. Um, and, you know, in television, think about it. 
So you've got the biggest networks, from the broadcast networks to the cable networks, and every year a whole new lineup of programming comes on. And even though they have millions of people watching those channels and the networks you know, every night, they still spend a significant amount of money marketing these new shows, telling people new shows are coming on. I mean, look at this year. We've seen many ads for Scorpion. We've been many, seen many ads for you know, all, of the new, all the new shows. And it's, I don't think it makes sense for us to put new shows up in the digital space and just expect people to discover them, right? So we have a strategy of marketing everything that we make. We have to tell the consumer that this new series or this new show or this new episode is coming out. And we had a particularly difficult um, task because our brands are not known for digital video. So we had to inform the consumer that, oh, Vogue, GQ, Glamour, um, Vanity Fair, Wired is now making all this digital video. So we're big believers in marketing. You cannot expect consumers just to find things and happen upon them. Now, what happens that we found, particularly on the scene, is that once people come in, they're incredibly engaged and they stay for long periods of time to discover other content. But they have to be in an environment where it's easy to discover, where the content is served to them in a, an interesting way, and they can find like-minded content. Mm -hmm. you know? so, so for example, our strategy even with the scene is that it's going to be curated and it's going to be a personalized experience. So you will, in the next few weeks, be able to come onto the scene. You'll be able to say which of the channels you like to watch. You'll be able to say what kind of content you like to watch. And then we can serve the content that's of particular interest to you. Again, that personalized branding opportunity, you make your own playlist, right? Right, right. So, uh, but I think that sit back and, oh, they'll find it, you know, mentality is just not realistic. And, you know, that's, again, you know, from traditional media to, to digital media across the board. It's too crowded out there. There are too many choices for them. Last question. Um, in your uh, old life with uh, Lifetime and with CW, you lived and died by the Nielsen ratings. Mm. You don't have the Nielsen ratings for digital video yet. So what, what are the metrics that matter for you? Well, I mean, <clears throat> don't get me started about Nielsen. Um, <laughs> because I've lived too many years. You know, we had a real challenge because before the CW was running UPN. And we had a real challenge because particularly the 18 to 34 year olds, you know, while I was at the CW, we single-handedly watched them migrate away from television onto other platforms, legally or illegally, you know, unfortunately. And so it was impossible to really capture where right. they all were. I mean, I would be in meeting after meeting with Les Moonves who would say, there's not a human being who's not talking about Gossip Girl. It's like a huge phenomenon. How could these be the numbers, right? So here you've got an opportunity to get immediate uh, response through social. Right away you can tell somebody's engaged, they're not engaged. They like, they don't like. Why and what's good and what's bad. And then on top of that, you've got much, um, much greater information you know, through all of the different platforms that we program on. I mean, but we'd be at YouTube or, you know, we, and you can get two, you've got so many choices of how you can really analyze the information mm -hmm. and how you can really get a clearer picture of what people are watching, why they're watching, what, what they respond to, and, you know, what they don't.